I think uh, that there is a lot of lot of room for the West before it really declines. So at this point, I think for India, the important thing is to carefully weigh what we call the correlation of forces. So, you know, in this week's Raja Mandala in your column, you've looked at a sort of bird's eye view to begin with of how wars in general reorient geopolitics, societies, international relations in particular, from Napoleon to the world wars. So one of the questions I had was, you know, the great understanding of the post-liberalization, post-Soviet order was that that whole thing, you know, there's no war with, with America if you have a McDonald's in that country, although they've shut down the McDonald's in China, in uh, Russia now. Uh, the notion that globalization would prevent conflicts of a certain kind of that economic integration would be a, if not peace, then certainly make the kind of conflict we're seeing this Cold War-like arrangement almost uh, nearly impossible. Do you think that consensus about globalization as being the defining world order and in some ways the economic integration preventing conflict has now been put paid to completely? Yeah, I think uh, there was this uh, strong illusion uh, that somehow economic globalization uh, and democratization, I mean, and that was the other, that the rise of liberal democracy and uh, capitalism will simply eliminate conflict and much of the world. Uh, this was the thesis of uh, end of uh, history uh, argument. Uh, and uh, what we've seen was that, that uh, uh, in the last few years, I, mean, I think there is a clear sense that, look, that globalization has not ended conflict within nations and between nations. Uh, because, for example, in the US, so many parts of the developed world, uh, which had uh, led the, the campaign for globalization, uh, not everybody benefited equally uh, from globalization. Uh, similarly, and within the countries too, uh, that the China's capacity to leverage globalization to its national benefit uh, was seen by many as at the cost of others. So therefore, the question of rearranging uh, the relationships uh, under this new set of rules that has emerged at all this in the last few years. And then nationalism, which is a powerful force in human affairs, uh, that has not disappeared, contrary to the uh, hopes uh, that in fact, uh, Russia has ambitions. Now, so Russia thinks Ukraine should be part of Russia. Russia thinks it has a, a, a case for a sphere of influence in Europe. Or China thinks it should be the natural dominant power of, uh, of, uh, of Europe, uh, in, of Asia. But Japan has no reason to accept Chinese claims, nor does India have reasons to accept Chinese claims. So I think the roots of conflict have not been uh, eliminated by either by democracy or by the emergence of globalization, because even among the allies, for example, nationalism constantly threatens the relationship between South Korea and Japan, uh, where history, memory of, of, the, yeah. of the Japanese occupation in Korea creates problems. So it's not just you can simply wipe out these feelings. And I think the world is waking up to those realities. But this is not a new phenomenon, uh, uh, Akash. And if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you had actually the thesis that uh, economic cooperation would end wars. Just yeah. before the First World War, one of the most gruesome wars, this idea that uh, more business, more trade would bring peace, that was shattered quite strongly uh, immediately uh, 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 after the thesis was propounded. You know, then the second, uh, so one of the points you make in the piece, everyone should have a look at it. There's a lot more there that we're talking about here. It's on the IndianExpress.com and probably in the description wherever you're watching this video. So, you know, you talk about how one of the consequences of this recent conflict, which and is that America, that, that the so-called decline of the West and decline of America is, I think obituary was written too quickly. America has been very much active. You see Europe rearming. But how do you see or talk of Europe, especially Germany rearming after the first time on this scale since the Second World War? How do you see this as being different from the earlier phase of the Cold War where you actually saw one, is it fatigue on America? They've just withdrawn from Afghanistan. So that boots of the ground kind of thing is perhaps out of the question. But America is no longer only the complete net security provider. One gets the sense that in this kind of conflict, if it, if these pol if these positions harden with China, Russia on one side and the, U the US and Western Europe and the other NATO oh, as a shorthand, that this time there's also this, say, whether it's a post-Trump effect or after Afghanistan, let's say Germany saying it's going to rearm itself. 
and Japan saying that we might go both things you point to. We might consider developing a nuclear weapon, or at least open the debate on a, on a your column earlier, some weeks ago was on this, in fact. Do you see that as being different? That it's it's no longer just it is American led, of course, but you'll also have other major players which weren't players, say, in the 20th century, middle of the post-war 20th century in the same way, Germany in particular. Look, I think this, it is so tempting and fashionable to believe in the decline of the West uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, it goes back uh, to the early 20th century when a book called The Decline of the West, a two-volume study by Spengler was published in, I think, 1902 or 1903. Uh, since then, you can argue at one level, West has continued to decline. Yeah. Uh, there has been decolonization, there's been creation of new states, but the net way to the US and the West as the source of capital, as the source of technology, and as the main uh, kind of uh, vehicle of regulating global finance, those have not disappeared with the rise of China, with the rise of the East, the global South, you can put all these factors together. But the net weight in the US to shape global order and global institutions, and partly if the West is united, I mean, if America and Europe are united, as we're seeing today in the Ukraine crisis, the capacity to shape the international system remains very, very strong. Uh, because Russia, for, for all the, the bravado about being a great power uh, and significant military capabilities, it's only one-tenth of the size of uh, European economy. Yeah. So Russia can be a nuisance. I mean, it, it can throw its nuclear weapons around, but it can't be a competitor in economic terms. China, on, in contrast, has risen to be great economic power, but it's still, you put the Americans at 22, 24 uh, trillion dollars, Europe at 16. Uh, China has a long way to go. And China has vulnerabilities, because China has deep interdependence with America and the West and the markets. So therefore, the US capacity to, to play these levers is, is fairly strong. And I think here, yeah, the Afghanistan withdrawal was misread quite badly uh, across the board, including in India. Uh, that US left by saying very clearly they want to focus on the great power threats. What Biden was doing was to cut his losses and say, look, you can't keep fighting in the bad lands of Afghanistan uh, in order to put a regime uh, that would you know, bring democracy, whatever it is. I mean, that was quite clear. It was not going to happen after two decades. Yeah. But it was the focus on Russia and China that, that the US decided, OK, enough is enough. Uh, and let the regional powers handle it, uh, that it is going to focus on the, on the bigger threats. So they were not hiding that intention. But I think somehow this you know, the idea that, look, Americans were leaving, you know, chaos in the Kabul airport, you know, it's very kind of reinforces the image of an American, uh, you know, retreat and the Western disarray. Therefore, uh, it, the end is here for the, for the West. It's not true. And that same, you know, when I was growing up in the 60s, the hippies, the long hair and the, the whole sense that, look, West is in decline, there's flower children, campus protests in the US, everybody's on drugs. Uh, it's again the Russians and Soviet communists and the Chinese communists believe this is the end of the US. Yeah. But five, just 10 years later, after the defeat in Vietnam in 75, five years later, they were back in Asia with a ban putting Russia on the defensive and in alliance with China. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think uh, that there is a lot of, lot of room for the West before it really declines. So at this point, uh, I think for India, the important thing is to carefully weigh what we call the correlation of forces yes. and not to be tempted by into believing your own propaganda or into believing uh, ideological you know certitudes that often mislead us but today it's as i said it's a hinge moment yeah. india has to be careful it has to calculate the power play in a in a very careful manner and to find its course within that context right so you know one of the things i mean there's no uh, you mentioned in the uh, column about india's need for independence in strategic terms and military terms. That has to be a, at best, but that can be a medium term goal. But so for right now, sir, for New Delhi, is it, are we doing enough to be talking to say other powers that have concerns, given that in one way, Russia has sharpened the threat from China as well, like you're saying for Japan, for us, do you think that we're doing enough on other immediate diplomatic fronts to be in touch, to try to build a certain kind of voice. Listen, this is Russia today. It could be China and Taiwan tomorrow or in our neighborhood. It can be, do you think India is doing the short-term diplomatic maneuvering that this kind of opportunity presents? No, you can do more diplomacy. You can talk about mediation. You can talk about providing venues. But look, in the end, 
you know, our leverage is limited. I mean, I don't think we should have any illusions uh, that somehow, you know, Russia has set certain ambitions. It's put itself at odds with the U.S. Uh, and Russians are going to negotiate. If they feel that, they, that they're losing it badly, maybe they will negotiate. But at this point, uh, the rest, we, we have limited leverage in shaping the outcome. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, building self-reliance and defense is a is a medium-term or even a long-term goal. But you have to start at some point. For 30 years, we kept said, look, let's keep Russia on our side. So we kept buying more and more and more. Uh, but today, it's so it's not a question of replacing Russia with France or Israel or the US. It is that you are a big market. The rest of the world is interested in your market. So can you frame a set of policies that make it attractive for other manufacturers to come to India and produce the weapons in India and export it to the rest of the world. For example, in our neighborhood, China exports weapons to Pakistan, to Bangladesh, to Sri Lanka. And here we are, we have nothing to offer to anyone. Yeah. So I think it's whether you have to start at some point. And that's why we use the phrase war footing, yeah. that it's only in war that you begin yeah. to take those big decisions. Or for example, on the COVID crisis, it's only because of the dramatic crisis in the second wave that you started producing a whole lot of things uh, which you're not doing before. So I think there's a lot of room there. If you start today, maybe five years down the road, uh, when there is another crisis between the major powers, we are not caught in the same situation. So uh, it's, it's not that the goal is not recognized. The Prime Minister Modi has repeatedly talked about it. What you need is a set of policies that actually make it easier to produce weapons in India and I think that's where the challenge for the government is going to be. Thank you so much, sir. We will, of course, be keeping track of Ukraine on the IndianExpress.com as with other major international stories. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much.